1975, the band Pink Floyd came out with a song called Wish You Were Here. And I want to read some of the lyrics. It says, so, so you think you can tell, heaven from hell, blue skies from pain. Can you tell a green field from a cold steel rail, a smile from a veil? Do you think you can tell? How I wish, how I wish you were here. We're just two lost souls swimming in a fishbowl year after year, running over the same old ground. What have we found? The same old fears. Wish you were here. And I like that song because I think it really captures the confusion that can surround suffering and pain. And it, it raises questions. How do we make sense of all of this? Why are we here? Why all the pain? And if God is a loving God, how can he allow suffering? That's a great question. It's probably one that most of us have had. It's also an important question. Getting an answer to this question can make or break your relationship with God. I want to get real with this conversation. Do you see yourself or anyone that you love in any of these scenarios? Your life looks so bleak that at times it's hard to get out of bed in the morning. Everything seems so hopeless that the thought of facing another day is agony. Or your hopes for your marriage have all collapsed and you're left broken and bitter wondering how this happened to you. Or the abuse that you endured as a child is like a bad dream that won't go away. It seems to have entangled itself into every area of your life. Or maybe you poured your life into your children. You had high hopes for them, but now it's all gone wrong, and they're only a source of pain and worry. Or you're reeling with the news that you have cancer, or you lost your mom or a close relative that you couldn't live without, or maybe the same regrets pounce on you day after day as you consider missed opportunities, a missed relationship, and missed chances at real joy. Or maybe nothing is really that bad, but you realize that life is slowly slipping away, and you wonder why there isn't a greater sense of peace and satisfaction in it all. How do we reconcile these real-life experiences with the idea that God is a loving God? Well, the Bible can help us. 1 Peter 2, 18 Peter is talking to servants as they relate to their masters. And he says this, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious or commendable thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you've been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself, Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Let's consider three specific questions that we often have when it comes to suffering. Number one, is God judging me when I suffer? Well, over the first two sessions, we've seen a God that is merciful and loving toward us, even in the midst of our sin and rebellion. Don't get me wrong. The Bible clearly teaches there will be a judgment when we die, but God is not judging us now. He's actually suspending judgment for a later time. So if our suffering in this life is not God's judgment, why do we suffer? Well, there are several reasons. We suffer because we live in a sinful, 
or a fallen world. Now, it wasn't always this way. When God created the world, there was no pain or suffering or sickness or trials or disasters. Those things were not a part of God's original design. But Adam and Eve tragically turned away from their creator, choosing instead to create their own rules. They sinned, and their disobedience brought sin into the world. Their rebellion brought suffering and sickness and disaster into the entire human race. They tarnished and poisoned the world. So we suffer because we live in a sinful and a fallen world. We also suffer because of the sin of others. When people sin against us, it causes us to suffer. In verse 19, Peter says, For this is a gracious or commendable thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. What is Peter talking about when he says unjust suffering? Well, that means suffering when you suffer even though there's nothing you've done to deserve it. And many people in the world today experience unjust suffering. Take, for instance, the problem of hunger in the developing world. Children are starving and not getting the nutrition they need. And it's not just because food isn't being sent. Even from our church, we have a program that feeds and cares for over a thousand orphans in Africa. One of the reasons food isn't getting to the children is because of the corrupt, sinful leaders who at times exploit their own people. Corruption creates wars. <laughs> wars create famines. And famines create more wars. The results are devastating, bringing suffering to millions of people. But unjust suffering can hit closer to home. Your child is killed by a drunk driver. Your husband leaves you for another woman. Your house is robbed. Your parents were unloving or even abusive. Your coworkers or neighbors discriminate against you. These are all examples of unjust suffering. So we suffer when people sin against us. We also suffer because of our own sin. In verse 20, Peter says, For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious or commendable thing in the sight of God. In other words, if you do something wrong and you get punished for it and you endure the punishment, you don't get extra credit. You deserved it. If you get a speeding ticket, don't curse at the cop under your breath. Don't kick the dog when you come home. It's your fault. Endure it. Take what you deserve. Now, most of us don't do well with this. We don't like consequences, and we often do whatever we can to avoid them. The easiest way to do that is usually to blame others. I don't know if you heard the story about a guy in Pennsylvania who robbed someone's house. As he exited the house, he went through the garage. He shut the door to the house, and that door locked. The garage door was malfunctioning, so he could not get out of the garage. The family was away on vacation for eight days days, and he was trapped in the garage. He survived on a case of Pepsi and a large bag of dry dog food. When he finally got out, he sued the homeowners, claiming that the situation caused him undue mental anguish, and the jury agreed to the tune of $500,000. We don't like consequences. But that doesn't mean we don't deserve them. There are consequences when we sin and disobey God. Galatians 6, 7 says, we reap what we sow. If you sow corn, you're going to reap corn. If you sow bad things, you're going to reap bad things. Proverbs 19, 3, it says, a man's own folly ruins his life, yet his heart rages against the Lord. It's often our own sin, our own foolishness that ruins our life, that, that brings destruction to us. 
when I was a teenager, my brother and I were really into skateboarding. So we loved doing all this kind of skateboarding. And there was a trick that we did called an ollie, where you kick the board up and you jump onto different things like a curb. Well, I did this ollie, went up on a curb, I leaned back too far, put my arm back, and I broke my arm. And my arm was like up here, like my hand, it was, it was horrific. The good news was I was able to get a cast, so that way I kept skateboarding. So I'd fall down, but the cast would protect me, and I kept skateboarding with this cast. The week that I got my cast off, I was skateboarding again. I did the same trick, did an ollie, went up on the curb, leaned back too far, slipped, put my arm back, and broke my arm again in the same spot. I can't even touch my arm in that spot to this day. It feels like it's still broken. My brother and I just sat down on the curb, and we just cried. Now, I also remember that I got very angry at God. I was furious. I decided, I told my mom, I no longer believe in God. And so she invited the priest to come over to have a conversation with me. And that wasn't a good idea, especially for the priest. It was my own foolishness. It was my own sin that caused this. And yet, my heart raged against the Lord. I blamed God. I blamed God for this. If you do drugs and alcohol and you end up losing everything, whose fault is it? If you spend most of your time at work and you end up in a painful divorce, whose fault is it? If you spend hours looking at pornography and you can't seem to have a successful relationship, whose fault is it? See, we don't like to admit things are our fault, and so we blame others and we blame God. But one of the reasons we suffer is because of our own sin. It's not necessarily because God is judging us. We often suffer because of sin. Sin in this world, sin that others commit against us, and sin that we ourselves commit. Here's a second question we often have when it comes to suffering. Is God able to redeem my suffering? In other words, is God able to use my suffering for good, or is it all just meaningless? Are we just two lost souls swimming in a fishbowl year after year? Well, the Bible teaches that God allows and even brings suffering for our good. God can actually use suffering for your good. There are several ways that he does that. Suffering can bring us to God. One of the primary reasons that God allows trials and difficulties is to draw men and women to himself. When you don't have many trials, when things are going your way, you don't really see your need for God. But when you're suffering, when you're going through a trial, you begin to be aware of your weakness and your sin, and you see your need for help. You see your need for God. I know that many here are in the midst of suffering or some sort of trial. Maybe God has used that to bring you to the bridge course. That's a good thing. Suffering can bring you to God. But it doesn't have to. Many who suffer just get angry at God and write him off. Others are just confused and disillusioned and simply ignore God or drift away. But God can use suffering to draw you to the Father. What trial are you going through right now? Where are you suffering? Maybe God isn't judging you or trying to make your life miserable. Maybe he's trying to bring you to himself. Suffering can also bring maturity. God can use suffering to mature us and cause us to grow. God wants Christians to be more like him, to grow in maturity, and the way that that happens is through trials. I wish it were different, but the Bible says again and again that growth comes through trials. In James chapter 1 and verse 2, he says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now think about that. How can consider it pure joy, not somewhat joy or not some joy or not just joy, but pure joy. So you're going through a difficulty, you're going through a trial. This isn't just joy, this is pure joy. How can he say that? I mean, what is he thinking when he says this? I don't consider my trials pure joy. Well, let's read on. 
He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Trials produce in us a perseverance, and that perseverance matures us and makes us complete. Jerry Bridges tells this story in his book, Trusting God, about a cecropia moth. He says, one of the many fascinating events in nature is the emergence of the cecropia moth from its cocoon, an event that occurs only with much struggle on the part of the moth to free itself. The story is told of someone who watched a moth go through this struggle. In an effort to help and not realizing the necessity of the struggle, the viewer snipped the shell of the cocoon. Soon the moth came out with its wings all crimped and shriveled. But as the person watched, the wings remained weak. The moth, which in a few moments would have stretched those wings to fly, was now doomed to crawling out its brief life in frustration of ever being the beautiful creature God created it to be. What the person in the story did not realize was that the struggle to emerge from the cocoon was an essential part of developing the muscle system of the moth's body and pushing the fluids out into the wings to expand them. By unwisely seeking to cut short the moth's struggle, the watcher had actually crippled the moth and doomed its existence. Do you think that a good parent gives their children everything they want? No. Sometimes a good parent is going to let their child struggle. Sometimes they're going to do things that the child doesn't understand. And it's the same with God. God doesn't always give us what we want. But if we belong to God, he will use our struggles and our suffering for our good. Suffering can also bring a longing for a better place. God can use suffering to make us long for our true home. If this world was all there is to life, then suffering would seem meaningless at best and cruel at worst. But this world is not all there is. You were not created for this world. You were not created for satisfaction in this world. You were created for a person and a place. That person is Jesus, and that place is heaven. This place is temporary. We're meant to be pilgrims here, just passing through, but so often we focus on making this heaven on earth, trying to make this life heaven. And so what God does is he sends trials to detach us from earth, to separate us from earth and make us long for our true home, for a better home. Every morning when I get out of bed, I have to stretch my back because my back is very stiff. I also have to stretch my neck. I recently had a cortisone shot in my foot. I've had surgery on both of my shoulders. My left one is still not where it needs to be. I pulled a bicep tendon, which doesn't seem to want to heal. I have terrible allergies, which I've had my entire life. I've broken several bones. I've had tons of stitches. My eyesight is terrible and my memory is shot. And I'm not even that old. I don't know what it's going to look like later on. I can't imagine what it's going to look like later on. God's goal for us in our short time on earth is not just temporary happiness. It's to prepare us for eternity, to make us long for our true home. So we can see that some suffering is caused by sin, the sinful world, the sin of others, and our own sin. We also see that God can use suffering to bring us to himself, to mature us, and to cause us to long for a better place. These things can help us make sense out of some of our suffering, but not all. There are times when we suffer and it doesn't make any sense. You can't see any reason for it or any good that can come of it. There's mystery in suffering. There are things that we can't understand this side of eternity, and we don't like mystery. We like answers. But if we understood everything, wouldn't that make us God? I mean, it makes sense that there would be mystery when it comes to God. We shouldn't be able to understand all that he does, just like a child can't understand all that a parent does. There's mystery when it comes to suffering, and that brings us to our 
third question that we often have when it comes to suffering. Is God there when I suffer? Because it doesn't seem like it. It can feel like we are all alone. Suffering can come in small packages. You can't find your phone. The car's in the shop again. The kids need braces. Gas prices are up. You failed the test. Your three-year-old refuses to be potty trained. But it can come in large packages as well. The tumor is malignant. The relationship is over. The accident is fatal. Suffering leaves us vulnerable and helpless. What do you do? You can't change it. You can't escape it. You look for reasons. There are none. You, you blame yourself. You blame others. You blame God. You think, where is God? I thought he wasn't supposed to let these kinds of things happen. I mean, we can feel like we've done the best job that we can with the cards that have been dealt to us. And then suffering comes and God doesn't seem to come through. Well, maybe he does come through but in a way that we didn't expect. We talked about how sometimes when we suffer in this life, we can look back and see why it, it makes sense. When I was four years old, I lost both of my parents. I can see how God took me from a very bad situation in that home to a much better situation. It, it makes sense to me. But sometimes we suffer in this life and we can't see why. It makes very little sense. My wife Trish lost her dad to cancer when she was nine years old. And I wanna to read to you some of a journal that her mother wrote. They grew up in Lancaster County and they lived in a little trailer. And so her dad had moved the trailer over onto some blocks and he began to build a house for them. And he had poured the foundation. He was building the frame of it. And Trish remembers uh, as he was doing this, he would just get so weak and tired, he would lay down on the piles of wood to try to regain his strength. And finally, he, he went to the doctor. And this is what it says. Finding no good doctor available, my sister and I took you into the ER at Lancaster General Hospital. You were admitted. The nightmare begins. A horrible, ugly word casts a dark shadow on the whole world. The doctor asked my sister if she thinks I'm prepared to be told my husband has cancer. She says, yes. My lips agree, but my heart and mind shout, no, God, you can't do this. They're doing all manner of tests to discover your problem. Nothing shows up. Then on the fourth day, the CAT scan shows the evil thing, a tumor grown around the spinal column, hardly accessible for surgery. Dr. Pohl comes to talk to me. He explains things and offers no hope. The verdict he will die of this tumor. I hear the very words spoken. I could not even form them in my mind. It was August 15, 1979. Black, black day. My heart is so heavy it seems I can't physically carry it around. It weighs about two tons it seems. I pull back from God's gentle leading. Oh God, no, I don't want to go this way. It's dark and unfamiliar. I like to walk where my surroundings are familiar and comfortable and I can see where I'm going. Please don't take me this way. And God gently answers, yes, I know the way is dark and unfamiliar to you, but I am here by your side, holding your right hand. My arms of love will keep you from falling. So I go along unwillingly, railing against him in anger sometimes like a spoiled child. But he keeps his promise. He never lets go of my hand or leaves my side. Now, one of the amazing things that happens during this time is the church that they are part of, just this tiny little church in Lancaster, they come over, basically the entire church is coming over every weekend and finishing the house. All the men are building the house. The ladies are helping and preparing lunch. Every weekend, they're building this house until it's finally finished. And then Trisha's mom says this, finally, everything that has taken up all our energy, time, and effort is coming to a climax. The rugs are in, the curtains are up. We bundle you up in a sleeping bag and tie you with a sheet to a chair to keep your back straight. And you're carried out of our old trailer into our new house. They set down the chair. Everyone steps back and you look around with an expression of wonder on your face. Then you begin to thank our friends and you're overwhelmed. You put your hand over your eyes and begin to weep. You're not a person given to the shedding of tears. And when I see you weep, I go over to you and press your face against mine and our tears flow together. 
Swallowing has become difficult for you. It gets worse during the day so that by evening you can't swallow at all. You've stopped eating. And when I look at your dear face, I can clearly see your skull outlined, your eyes set down deep in bony ridges. Those arms which were so strong and capable of much hard work, which once so expertly wielded a tennis racket, smashing balls across the net from the farthest corner of the court, are now no bigger than a broomstick. But we haven't come to grips with it and look death in the face. I know I must face it, so I force myself to say aloud, he's going to die. I go to you later that evening and we talk about it and just have a sweet, precious time together. You say, let's pray. So I pray first, then you pray. Tonight, Lord, I go to bed knowing that the Lord will take you very soon. My heart breaks, but I feel strangely relieved because I have let go. I have relinquished my tight hold on you and released you to God's perfect will, even if that perfect will is death. It was so hard giving you up. I loved you so very much, my dear Ira. I sit with you with my arm under your neck and watch your dear face. You're struggling with some fluid in your throat, but you're not in agony. Finally, you start drawing long, deep breaths with a long pause between. I listen, not daring to breathe myself because I know one of these breaths will be your last. You draw a breath. I wait and wait. And I know this very instant your soul is winging into glory. You've left this bed of suffering. You're free. But how I wish I wasn't left behind. Then she says this. Thank you, God, for working everything out so marvelously that we could have him a while longer. Thank you for a lovely Christmas. Thank you that Dad got to enjoy our house with us. Thank you for the quality of life he enjoyed, that he didn't suffer like some cancer patients. Thank you for not taking him at a time when I couldn't be with him. Thank you for so many things. How can someone say this? How can, how can she thank God? How, how could she trust God with something like this? Because God suffers with us. God is not watching from a distance, removed from the suffering of the world and unaffected. He's not a cold, cruel judge who doesn't care about what we're going through. No. God suffers with us. He weeps with us in our time of pain and suffering. In John 11:35, it's the shortest verse in the Bible. It just says this, Jesus wept. He was standing in front of the tomb, in front of the tomb of his friend that he was about to raise from the dead. And he wept. He wept because of all the pain, all the sorrow, and all the suffering. God suffers with us. But that's not all. God also suffers for us. How did he suffer? Well, he suffered by hanging on a Roman cross for six hours. Why did he do this? Why did he suffer? Verse 24 tells us, it says, He himself, that's Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree, that's the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. When Jesus died on that cross, he was not dying for his own sin. He was bearing, he was carrying our sin. He took our penalty for his own. If you're angry about unjust suffering, you should be most angry that Jesus suffered on the cross. He didn't deserve it. He didn't deserve God's wrath. But because of our sin, we deserve death. We deserve separation from God. But most of the time, we receive mercy. We don't get what we deserve. It's the mercy of God that our hearts beat through the night, that we have food and clothes and a place to live. But there will come a day when you will die and stand before God, and he will settle accounts with you. 
And if you have not repented and trusted fully in Christ, then you will meet with his justice. What do you do? Let me go back to my mother-in-law. The reason that my mother-in-law could find peace and hope in the midst of such a difficult situation was because she had an even greater need than keeping her husband alive. And that need was to be forgiven of her sin and rebellion against God. Jesus took her place on the cross so she wouldn't have to suffer the penalty for her sin. On the cross, Jesus purchased for her the gift of God's forgiveness. And when she was 23 years old, she received that gift by repenting and surrendering her life to Christ. She had a disease too, a spiritual disease of sin. And by the wounds of Jesus, by his sufferings, she was healed of her disease. The spiritual disease of sin that's like an incurable cancer in us all. And by the wounds of Jesus, you too can be healed of your spiritual disease, the sin that threatens to destroy you. You can be forgiven and assured a place in your true home with the person you were created for, Jesus Christ.